name is Srila Nair and I'm the clinical dietitian working with MediClinic City Hospital. So today we'll be uh, talking about one of the interesting topics which everyone is curious about of how to manage that and what needs to be done. What is the right practice? What is the wrong practice? And how I can or how we can, you know, uh, make sure that the lifestyle is such a way that, you know, my health is also good, but I don't have to do any extreme uh, you know, measures as well. So what we're going to talk about is obesity and the weight loss uh, regimes that you can uh, accept and try doing it. So when you're talking about overweight or the terms like obesity, what it technically means is it's the accumulation of fat in your body and this is something which leads to certain risk factors uh, in case if the accumulation goes in a very high higher level so that's what over overweight and obesity mean so when we divide the classification into overweight and obesity there's something the term called as body mass index which helps us to analyze is your weight ideal for your height for your age for your gender so this is the general formula that we use and this is the classification that we uh, use to uh, differentiate or uh, the class of overweight, obesity uh, and so and so forth. So usually the normal weight that we term as is between the body mass index of 18 to 25 and then the higher it goes and the higher the classification is from overweight to obesity class 1, 2 and then it is morbid obesity. Now let's understand we are in UAE and uh, UA is a place where you know, uh, the lifestyle is a little different. Now, if you see the statistics, uh, the recent statistics in UA, you see there is such a high number of uh, people with obesity and also weight, and it is just increasing day by day. So this is a bit concerned. And that's the reason I know the obesity is also considered as a disease. So it's not just a lifestyle factor, it's a disease. So it needs to be taken care of the way you would take care of any other clinical conditions. So that's the seriousness that you have to give for your health when it comes to your weight. The risk factors that you're talking about, the more the weight goes high, the certain risk factors is affecting the heart, causing any heart disease, diabetes, gallstones, uh, certain types of cancers. Now, if when you're talking about cancers like colon cancer, kidney, stomach, breast, uh, obesity plays a very important role. Even if you go through certain um, uh, uh, organizations like research organizations like the World Health Organization, you'll see weight is one of the contributing factors for majority of the cancers. So it's very important that managing your weight is uh, equal to healthy uh, healthy body. Now, when you're talking about weight, what is a healthy weight and how do you get that or what is an unhealthy weight and how that happens? So this, this is the difference when you're talking about positive energy balance where your input of energy or calories is higher than output, which means you're eating more you're eating more of high calories, high fat, but when it comes to your utilization in terms of physical activity, that's comparatively lesser. So this picture directly depicts how the uh, the balance is, the more the energy input and the lower the energy expenditure. Similarly, you have the negative energy balance. So weight does not always that only overweight and obesity is unhealthy for the body. We are also talking about underweight that is also unhealthy and that's where the negative energy balance happens when your food intake. So food need not always be unhealthy in terms of weight gain. It can also be in terms of weight loss. So when you're eating less but your uh, output is too high, that's also not healthy because then that leads to being underweight and that over a period of time affects your bone mass, it affects it affects your fertility and so and so forth. So it's very important that you need to have a energy balance, which means your input and your output, that is your energy consumption and your exercise or physical activity, both should be at par, which helps you to create a balanced energy and maintain your healthy weight. Now what works? So 
The most common is, of course, the lifestyle factors, which includes not only your eating habits, but it includes your exercise, your stress levels, your sleep factors, uh, your social habits like smoking and alcohol. And this in a combination is a healthy lifestyle. It's not that, OK, I'm going to lose weight, so I'm just going to just cut down on my food. I'm just going to do a little exercise and I'm going to be, going to be fine. This is a combination and yes, it's very important that the reason why it's a profession led for us to make sure that what you're losing is the unhealthy uh, fat weight and not just the vitamins and minerals, which leads to other clinical risk factors in terms of deficiencies. Now, besides your lifestyle factors, not besides, it's the, the common default uh, 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 activity that you're supposed to do in life, lifestyle intervention. Besides that, there are certain other methods that have come as a support for weight loss. One is the weight management medications. This is something which we do talk about in situations where the body mass index is too high for a person to lose weight in a faster uh, uh, time period, specifically if the weight is affecting the quality of life. And that's another way when we uh, do recommend that, OK, sometimes medications, but under supervision and the supervision of the doctors, the dietitians to make sure that you are not uh, uh, no, uh, causing any other problems for yourself. Usually this is underutilized. People presume that, OK, if I'm going to take medications is a shortcut. No, it's not a shortcut. As, as I said, as long as it's under proper supervision, this is something which could benefit. And there is another way uh, which is called as a weight loss surgery. There are different type of surgeries which also um, are a help or a support to ensure that OK, uh, if the quality of life is affected and the lifestyle alone is not enough as of now to give immediate results, this is something which is going to help you. And but of course, the lifestyle would be the longer run like lifelong lifestyle is what is going to help you maintain the weight. These are just support systems for you all. So these are the different types of now if you see in this generation, there are different types of diets we are following. We follow the Atkins diet, the keto diet. We also go paleo. Intermittent fasting is very common. As long as this is done under the supervision to make sure that you're not really just losing the weight, but you're being healthy in terms of your lean muscle mass, uh, your deficiencies of vitamins, minerals, is everything is taken care of. This is something which you can uh, uh, no take care of. So when you're talking about weight loss, yes, when you're talking just lifestyle, we would say, okay, weight loss is usually five to ten percent, which is good, which is good. It's not a small number. It's good in a way where you are gradually or casually entering into a routine because lifestyle modification, it's not a duty or responsibility. It's supposed to be uh, your your lifestyle, not something which you're doing naturally. So five to ten percent is what we see the loss. Uh, medications, it's around five to 20 percent. Surgery is 30 to 40 percent. But as I said, when it comes to medication surgery, it's a support system in in situations where it's affecting the quality of life in the immediate uh, scenario, and that's when this is something which is uh, worth trying. So. When you're talking about, as I said, lifestyle, the one thing that comes into our mind is eating and healthy, and that helps with controlling a lot of risk factors uh, like blood pressure, diabetes, cancers, as I spoke earlier. So eating healthy is definitely uh, an important aspect. These are different. So this 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 slide is just for you all to understand what are the different types of medications which usually the doctors use and you know how it helps. Uh, and then there is surgery which I was talking about. Now let's go to the main part that is your lifestyle factors. There are different types of lifestyle factors which together combine to create a healthy weight. One is a balanced diet, no smoking alcohol, exercise with proper hydration, making sure that you are st your stress levels are under control and getting good sleep. Every factor, every criteria is very important. And we need to make sure that this is not something which is just going to happen overnight. You have to give yourself time. You have to make sure that you are uh, getting complied to all these uh, factors in a very uh, casual way so that it becomes a habit and not just a duty that you have to do for a small period of time. Uh, doctor, sorry, you were stuck for uh, five seconds. Can okay. you just repeat the slide? 
the present slide. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So when we're talking about lifestyle interventions, as I said, it's not just a combination of food and exercise, but it's food along with exercise, your hydration, making sure that your stress levels are under control. We are not saying that you should not have stress, but managing stress is very important. Getting good sleep is important and we'll further discuss about why it is important in terms of weight. Uh, social habits like smoking and alcohol also needs to be considered when you're talking about healthy weight or healthy body. Coming back to the food, now you have different food groups. You have carbohydrates, which includes your greens. You have your proteins, your fats, your vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, all these. Every component is important when it comes to healthy food. It's not just OK, carbohydrate leads to weight gain and you just remove carbohydrate from your diet. It's very important that you have a sensible combination, an, a smart combination of these nutrients to ensure that you're still getting your body is still healthy, but it's not affecting your weight in any way. So as I said, it needs to be different combination. These are the different uh, groups that we are talking about. You have greens, vegetables, fruits, protein, dairy which also includes fats. Now, ideally, this is how your healthy plate should look like, where you have around 20 to 25% uh, of whole grains and rest is divided amongst your proteins, your vegetables, fruits, which will give you the fiber, vitamins and minerals, and of course the healthy oils. So in this pattern, so I'll give you one example, which is in my next slide. Now, uh, I don't know, uh, is, Veena, is this an interactive section? Can can people talk? People can post their questions on question and answer. So just in case if they have any comment or question, they are already posting. There are a couple of questions. Okay, already. Already. Do you want to take the questions on the go or towards the end of the session? Uh, anything is fine by me. Uh, if it's something which is related to the previous slides, uh, we can go. Otherwise, uh, we can just do it at the end so that we have all the questions together and we can answer it together. So coming back, so if you see over here, yes, it looks yummy. A lot of variety of foods are there, but if you see over here, majority of the foods are high in carbohydrate, like the chips, the nachos, the burgers, lots of fat is there with the, with the fat in because of the processed foods, the sodas, all this has high sugar in that. So when you're talking about this kind of a meal, yes, physically you're getting satisfied, but if you see the nutritional content is absolutely wrong. However, if you're going to switch to something like this, where you do have your whole grains, it can be rice, it can be bread, it can be pasta, it can be any of these starchy vegetables like potatoes, but you also have majority of the non-starchy vegetables like your bell peppers, your leaf vegetables and all these things and along with that protein. So it doesn't matter what cuisine you are eating, what nationality you are from, as long as your plate comprises of this kind of a combination, you will see that you still enjoy eating, but you're being safe and happy about it as well. Majority of us have this concept that if I have to be healthy with healthy weight, I have to have boring foods. Uh, I cannot enjoy my foods, the foods that I like. It's not about enjoyment. It's about how you're combining it, how you're consuming it in terms of the cooking method. And once you start doing this, you will understand that it is much better to control your weight or weight gain or reduce weight, but still enjoy food, which is something which we all love to enjoy. Now, these are different options of how your plate could look. As I said, you know, it can be different nationalities. It can be different cuisines, but if you see the combination, that's what matters. So in this way, you're still enjoying all the foods, but you're being careful about it as well. Also, when you're talking about calories, besides carbohydrate, we talk about fats. Fat is something which is giving calories, so we have to avoid fat. It's not about avoiding fat. It's about the portion control of fat because you do need some amount of healthy fats. You have healthy fats, which is present in nuts, uh, fruits like avocados. Why healthy fat is important? Because these healthy fats usually contain omega-3 fatty acid, which is essential for your brain development. It's essential for your heart maintenance. It's essential for it also works like an anti-inflammatory in certain uh, cases where the infection perspectives high, the immunity is low. It always helps as an anti-inflammatory. So choosing fat is definitely good. But again, as I said, portion control is what is important. So if I go back to my uh, previous slide, if you see over here, 
there are healthy oils also that is included in the plate, but see the portion size. That's the minimal portion size that we are keeping to ensure that you're still getting your nutrition, but you've been careful about it in terms of calories as well. So that's how smart this is. This is technically we say as a smart plate where you're still enjoying your meals, but you've been careful about it as well. Now we have this concept of low sugar products, uh, you know, uh, something which is uh, which is less in fat, but it's very important when you're buying any of these commercial products, you have to make sure that you start having a habit of reading the nutrition labels. Uh, what's the sugar content in that? What is the ingredients in that? Now, a lot of these breakfast cereals, if you see, they are having sugar coatings in that. So it might have a lot of fiber in that, but it equally has high sugar in that. So and when you have too much of sweets, too much of sugary items, it fills you up so fast, but it's also utilized so fast. So two situations happen when it fills you up very fast. You don't have uh, the decision making uh, situation to uh, have healthy foods and you don't even have place in your stomach to have healthy foods. And the other concept is because it's utilized faster, you get hungry faster, you end up eating more and more unhealthy foods. So that that also sometimes leads to weight gain. So it's very important when you're buying commercial products. Start having a habit of reading the nutrition labels for you to understand the portion size. How because every product has a ideal portion size. It's not that you just buy it and you just have it as per your filling. When you take care of those portion size, you see that you're still again enjoying all the foods, but you're being careful and it's healthy for you as well. So the other options which I say to try is some bowl of nuts that you can try. You can try a bowl of fruit as a snack rather than having these sugary cereals. These are less sugar and whatever sugar is, there is more of the natural sugar. Uh, sugar free gum is another option you can. So this is few options that you can try instead of specifically for people having sweet tooth. You know, a lot of lot of patients come to me like, uh, you know, I feel like having sweets immediately after my meals. OK, that's that's one of the uh, the situation. However, that need not be cookies and chocolates and cakes and all those things. Having any dairy based or fruit based sweet, which is naturally sweet, is also something which can be uh, utilized. It's just a, these habits are more acquired habits than than just the the nature that OK, I'm I'm more into sweets. It's more as you start eating, you start craving for more and then you just cannot cut back on that. So it's just more of a habit that you develop, which can be changed. If you can develop one habit, you can always change that habit and develop something healthy habits. So these are the other options which you can have. Now sodas. We talk about sodas and if you see this is a very small example of how the sugar content is. If you're taking one can of soda, it almost has 12 teaspoons of sugar and the average teaspoons of sugar that we suggest for a regular sedentary lifestyle is max to max two to three teaspoons and that is in a day. And if you see a soda, soda itself has 12 teaspoons of sugar. So you can you can see how uh, uh, the sugar intake happens in a disguised form and how well you can manage it once you understand what is good and what is bad by re reading the nutrition labels, uh, you know, uh, making healthier choices. So the simple thing is what you need to do. Few behavioral activities besides having a healthy plate, make sure that you have a consistent meal schedule. The more longer you keep the gap between your meals, the more hungry you get, the more uh, you're in a situation where your decision making uh, 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 point is not not proper. So you end up eating more unhealthy foods. Uh, another thing is stop eating when you're feeling full. Don't uh, sometimes what happens is we are in a situation where we just want to finish the plate or like, oh, I've bought this. Like, let me just finish that. So that's not how it should be. You are supposed to listen to your stomach. If you start feeling full, you should stop eating at that point itself to ensure that you don't end up overeating. What you need to avoid or what you need to look at the points that prevents you from overeating. Make sure they don't go hungry. The longer the gaps, as I said, the more the tendency for you to overeat is. Frequent snackings, you know, you might not eat big, huge meals, but the frequent snackings and specifically it's the processed foods and if it's some unhealthy snackings, you see that the fat and the calorie intake is much higher compared to just three main meals that you eat. Then of course, the refined products like the sugars, breads, the sugary drinks, eating very late at night, the more so 
and that's when the sleep comes into uh, consideration. The more late you're going to sleep, the more the tendency for you to you know snacking is always there and that again leads to weight gain as well. So eating late at night is also something which we need to avoid. That was about the food. So overall to summarize about the food is. Always try to keep a combination of your plate with lowest amount of carbohydrate and fats with lots of proteins, lots of vegetables. This will ensure that you can still continue using your regular cuisines, your regular favorite foods, but you're being careful about it as well. That is the input of calories. Then comes the output of the calories. It's very important that you balance how much you are utilizing the calories to ensure that the input is not high. So there's no positive energy balance. It's very important that exercise also needs to be part of your regime. Now excess need not be boring. It not, need not be that you always go to gym. There are different types of exercises. You just have to pick and choose. Sometimes even simple walking, you know, using the stairs, parking the car at the farthest corner of the entrance. You know, these are different, different exercises. If if majority of you all are doing some desk job where you're sitting, you know, you have these steps or these small uh, step machines which you can, if, if it's possible, you know, you get that and you can use that as well when you're doing your work. So a lot of these factors are there. You know, after after every three or four hours, take a one to two minutes break. You know, 60 seconds to 120 seconds and just take a walk around the office and then sit back. You will see that motivates you to start with the concept of exercise and the more you start doing with your healthy eating, your stamina gets better and you're more motivated to do the exercise. This is how you start with exercise. It's not that you right away day one you say, OK, I'm going to start with exercise. I'm going to join the gym and then you start off. The main thing is you should need to enjoy what you're doing because the more you enjoy doing it, the more motivated you're you are to continue doing that. So these are a few examples. Dancing, that's one of my favorite exercises that I tell my patients because this is something which is not only physically good for burning out the calories, but it is like a stress relieving activity as well. If, if, if some of y'all have just seen people dancing or when you just tap your uh, finger or your or your feet, you see that you start smiling, you are you're laughing, you feel you know, you feel good. And that's also one 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 contributor for stress relieving. So it's more or less what you enjoy doing and how you can start. And for these things, it's very important for your time management. The way I always give an example of the way you take out time to brush your teeth. You know, that's that's a very common thing. You would not leave your house without brushing your teeth, right? Because that's an inbuilt habit for you. Yeah. Similarly, when you start off with these practices with weight loss, it's not just doing these steps. It's about how you get yourself into a routine and for you to get into a routine, you have to consistently do all these things and you have to enjoy doing it. So when you start doing this, it same becomes like you no know, brushing your teeth. You would it, it just falls in place and when that happens, you still have time for your personal life. You still have time for your work. You still have time for your family, but you also have time for yourself in terms of your eating, exercise, stress -like activities and all. So that's how you need to manage your time as well. Then we're talking a lot of stress, you know, why stress is also equally important in terms of, uh, you know, weight. Uh, let's put it in a small scientific manner. So when you're stressed out, what happens is you're releasing a stress hormone called cortisol hormones. Now, few of the side effects of cortisol hormones, it's stubborn weight, weight gain, uh, insulin resistance, you know, digestive issues, mood issues. You'll see a lot of people say I'm very good with my eating habits. I'm very good with exercise, but I don't know why I'm not losing weight. I don't know why I don't feel good about it. And if you actually get into in depth, you'll see the stress factor is what is causing these kind of situations. So stress plays an equally important role when you're talking about weight, healthy weight. So managing stress is very important. So this is what happens when you're stressed out and you're not managing your stress. You tend to forget the healthier things that needs to be done. You just want to get things done with and then you start overeating and that overeating leads to consuming more unhealthy foods because you are in such a stressful situation that you're not able to think straight of eating healthy or making proper decisions. And then you get into these fat diets which without supervision. When you do this, you end up putting on weight. So it's very important that the way you take care of yourself in the eating method and exercise, you also have to take care of yourself in terms of stress. 
and also besides weight it also has other complications the more stressed out you are again it affects your immune system it affects uh, your diabetes digestive disorders which are already specified you no know, a lot of these factors are also in 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 a problem when your stress is at a higher level so how do you manage your stress so first of all find out what is stressing you out is it your office is it something personal or is it uh, your health in general once you identify that you have to make down a list of what are the factors which can help you know sometimes what i tell my patients is uh, stress relieving factors you know any hobbies that you have uh, any anything that you, know, you enjoy doing it can be reading it can be listening to music it can be exercise uh, any of the factors so you have to find out what is that one factor which helps you to uh, you know uh, relax yourself and even if it's just for 10 minutes per day just start doing that so that to a certain extent you might not be able to see a visual changes in yourself like how when you do exercise you'll see inches going down but when you are doing the stress activity you know relieving activities you see you start feeling much better and much motivated to do the physical factors that is food and exercise and of course sleep sleep is very important again the more late you sleep the more stress hormone is released and the more it is affecting your weight as well so it's very important that you get good quality it's not just quantity you might sleep at 1 o'clock 2 o'clock in the morning and you're like you wake up at 9 o'clock 10 o'clock you might get 6 to 8 hours of sleep but the quality of sleep is very very important that's the reason I'm sleeping on time uh, is is equally important not watching late night uh, shows uh, just 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 relaxing and then going off to sleep physical activity again the way stress releases uh, uh, your stress hormones similarly physical activity or exercise releases something called endorphins which helps to release uh, you know relax your nerve nervous system and that's something which is also relaxing or stress relieving and of course nutritious foods the more healthier you eat the more vitamins and minerals you get the more it is helping you with your metabolism and the more relaxed you feel the better your stamina is so all this is interrelated one you don't take care of don't expect the others also to you know fall in place so it's very important that when you start about a lifestyle you start managing all these factors cigarette is something uh, which we say no just not from the weight perspective but in general because it affects your total metabolism your organs in 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 every manner so that's the reason why we just say no to smoking and when it comes to alcohol so again alcohol does have an impact on your metabolism if if you your consumption of alcohol is high it decreases your metabolism which means it reduces your fat burning it weakens your muscles it impairs your immunity uh, and all these things also again leads to weight gain overeating and all those things so it's very important that uh, consumption of alcohol needs to be taken care of so overall if you see as i said it's a lifestyle it's not a responsibility you have to create this as a routine so making sure that you're eating the right food at the right time in the right manner making sure that exercise is part of your regime and try focusing on the exercise that you enjoy not just joining a uh, certain certain places uh focus on your stress relieving activities which also includes getting better sleep and of course your social habits like smoking and alcohol in combination once you start doing this you will see that you're much more energized and you see that your weight in general starts coming under control and your body gets much more healthier so that's the end of my session i can take in thank some thank you so much now uh, dr shreela i read out the questions for you yes so what are the long term side effects if we perform weight loss surgery okay so it depends on different surgeries uh, one of the long term uh, effects is 
there is always a risk of vitamin deficiencies uh, because of the type of surgery where either the stomach is restrictive, which means the portion size of food intake is goes less, or then there are surgeries where there is malabsorption with restriction, where even if you cannot eat more and the absorption is also less. In those kind of surgeries, the one of the longer side effects is that you can end up having vitamin deficiencies like vitamin D. It can lead to deficiencies of iron, vitamin B12. And the solution for that is to make sure that you have your multivitamins and your, of course, again, health. So whichever mode of uh, support that you get, diet, except your lifestyle will always remain constant. So when you're doing this uh, lifestyle changes, your vegetables, your fruits, your balanced diet will ensure that you're providing the nutrients and also as a support of supplements. So supplement is something which we, multivitamin is something which we tell to have as a lifelong thing. Uh, certain surgeries like sleeve gastrectomy where it is restrictive, uh, the tendency to put on weight after a few years is there if your lifestyle, that is your eating habit and your uh, exercise is not uh, disciplined and organized. So it's these are the common uh, what we say side effects that we see, uh, but when we are talking about surgery, we also talk about regular follow ups with the specialist to ensure that this situation never happens. So these are the usual side effects. Can you please provide some tips and guide guidance about intermittent fasting to start on diet plan? OK, so uh, you have different ratios of inter I'm pretty sure you all must have read about intermittent fasting and the different ratios of intermittent fasting. So what I usually suggest my patients to start off when they're doing it for the first time is start off uh, with 15 is to 2. So 15 hours you fast and the other hours you're not fasting and you do it twice um, in a week initially. And then you can go up to uh, 16 is to 8 hours where 16 hours you so let's say first two weeks you do 15 is to 2 so that you get a hangover how things needs to be done and then you go to 16 is to 8 hours that is something 16 is to 8 hours is the ideal uh, intermittent fasting uh, ratio yes it it might differ from age to age and that we will usually suggest once we get all the history and you know the, the lifestyle activities and as a history but 16 is to 8 is what is recommended in that we have to make sure that the 16 hours you have to hydrate yourself intermittent fasting does not mean that you are not going to eat or drink anything you have to hydrate yourself with water you can have some hot beverages like the herbal teas without sugar so that you are well hydrated and then of course the eight hours is the healthy eating and we always recommend that if you're doing intermittent fasting the maximum time period is six to eight weeks try not doing more than that because that's going to uh, affect your metabolism after one point so six to eight weeks is what we suggest after which you have to get into your regular balanced healthy eating lifestyle Can you please share with us a dietary menu of balanced diet? OK, that is uh, on a different thing. Doc, uh, so on this note, can can you tell us on um, on a specific what are the kind of diet which is best? Like is it Mediterranean? Is it which kind of cuisine you think uh, has the good? OK, this is uh, a it's a good question, but uh, when you're talking about different diets, of course, we do not recommend uh, fat diets like keto diet and all, which you saw in my folder. It's only and only when we are doing it under supervision because it has a lot of uh, disadvantages. Then the only advantage is it helps with weight loss, but a lot of disadvantages. Ideally, for me, I see, I feel it's Mediterranean is good. Um, uh, in general, if it, it and it doesn't matter about your cuisine, it's not the matter of cuisine. It's about it can be Asian cuisine, it can be Mediterranean cuisine, it can be Arabic cuisine. It's the matter of how it is cooked, how much how much healthily it is cooked. For example, 
let's take a common example of we have our biryani, right? We are in UAE and biryani is something which we very regularly see. So there are different ways of preparing biryani. You also have the high fatty biryani with a lot of oil, fried meat in that, but you also have the healthier version of biryanis where the oil is less, uh, the, 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 the meat is grilled or you know, uh, baked rather than uh, fried. So it's not about cuisine. It's about so I'll give you a few examples. Let's say you can all you can all always have a combination of let's say potatoes or mashed potatoes or roast potatoes with some grilled chicken with some grilled vegetables. Uh, you can also have some um, uh, you know, Arabic rice with uh, um, with some uh, protein and like a saluna with some with some vegetables or the saluna can be a combination of vegetables. Uh, if you're going for other versions, let's say you can also have chapatis or uh, or or uh, some uh, some brown rice with again some protein and protein can be the dal that is the beans or it can be the non veg with some vegetables uh, and some salad at the side or it can be even sandwiches you know if, if it's a sandwiches it can be whole grain sandwiches with stuffing of the vegetables and the protein not just cheese uh, sandwich or not just bacon or turkey sandwich none of those things it can even be pastas where you have whole grain pastas and to that you add lots of vegetables and some protein. So so it's not about the cuisine, it's about the method it is cooked. Certain cuisines where there is a lot of sauces that is used, so that's not something which we recommend because along with sauces comes lots of fat uh, inclusions as well. So it's about the method of cooking and the portion control. Even, even for example, a burger, you know, burger is considered to be unhealthy. Yes, fast food burger. Yes, it is unhealthy. But if you see a lot of these restaurant gourmet burgers where the patties is not the processed one, it's made out of the fresh minced meat. You do get now a lot of restaurants are getting healthier or even, even people are making their own baking. So, you know, they bake the whole grain uh, bun. So isn't that healthy where you add lots of vegetables, you add your low fat cheese and you add the fresh uh, minced meat patties rather than using the processed ones. So it's about how you make it and how the combination of the calories are. So next question is, uh, I have heard mixed opinions on whether to eat fruit before or after main meal on an empty stomach or not, please advise on this with a medical reasoning for suggested timing of conception for fruits. OK, so fruits usually we recommend to have it like 15, 20 to 30 minutes after meals uh, uh, or during the daytime, not in the late evening time, let's say post seven o'clock. The one of the reason is fruits are acidic in nature. So when you are talking about having these foods immediately after meals, it interferes with the digestion of the regular foods and affects the, the absorption. And this is the reason why we don't recommend to eat fruits immediately after the meals, rather give a break. So the best timing that I usually suggest is to have fruits as snacks like between your breakfast and lunch or between your lunch and dinner. So that is what we suggest to have uh, uh, the fruit uh, thing. Empty stomach, it's individualistic. It's not that it is going to affect you until unless your diet system cannot because different fruits have different types of sugar. You have the fructose sugar, you have the glucose sugar. So it's certain fructose sugar is a bit heavy to get digested. So some people cannot digest the fructose sugar and then when they have these fruits in the empty stomach, it either causes stomach upset or they're not, not able to digest it. So when it comes to empty stomach or even having citrus fruits during empty stomach, it's the individual's um, uh, no capacity of tolerance. If the person uh, cannot tolerate it, then we recommend not to have an empty stomach. But yes, definitely not immediately after the meals or late in the evening. Are artificial sweeteners on balance uh, good for you because they replace sugar? Should they be avoided because they are much sweeter than sugar? Encourage one to intake, intake more sweetness since they are low calories. Make one develops. OK, so basically the, the question doc is whether sweeteners, the artificial su sweeteners, are they good? OK, so there is no direct answer. It is good or it is bad. It is based on the type of sweetener. So you have sweeteners, which is the direct reverse uh, chemical composition of the sucrose. That is the sugar, the, the normal sugar. 
and then there are sweeteners where there is more chemicals like uh, saccharin and aspartame which is added. So the one which acts saccharin aspartame is not something which we recommend because of a lot of studies coming in that it affects uh, your metabolism uh, in terms of cancer and all those things. But when it comes to the ones which is the reverse chemical combination of the natural sugar that is sucrose, that's something which can be used but not on a regular basis. This is something which we say specifically for people having sweet tooth where the tendency for them initially to uh, you know, uh, move towards having the regular sweet is much higher. First step is we definitely tell them to start off with the natural sweetness that can be your dates. It can be the fruit, the, the natural fruits. And if still it's something so then in between we can we do tell them to use the sweetness. But again, it's not a regular uh, thing that we recommend like weekly twice is something which we go as a base and then depends on the on the person. So uh, doc, there is one question. Do normal sodas contain calories? So I would uh, want to repeat what you said initially during your presentation that all of the con food here has the calorie uh, details or whatever the content details at the back of the sticker of whatever food it is or the drinks. So you may want to refer that readings of the number of calories or whatever is the content of and also, and also adding to the sodas. So now we also have the trend of, you know, diet, coke, you know, zero, uh, whatever the sodas are called. Yeah, they might not have sugar content, but if you actually read this. So this is the reason why I said in my slide uh, before that reading the nutrition label, the nutrition table of every product is very important. It's not uh, to be obsessed about it, but just to have an idea of the regular foods that you eat. And if you see for these diets, you know, the caffeine content is also very high. So it's like you are pushing out one enemy by removing the regular sodas and then you're inviting another enemy, which is the caffeine content with the zero sodas. So uh, one of the uh, options that I sometimes suggest for people who love or like prefer eating fizzy drinks is uh, get your plain soda, the one which is uh, and does not have the caffeine content. Plain sodas, not the not the processed ones. And in that you can just add your berries, cherries. So it's fizzy. It's natural fruit. It doesn't have any caffeine and you enjoy your fizzy drink once in a while. So that's something which you can always try rather than having the diet, the diet Coke or the diet sodas. So I think that a couple of questions are there on the diet light or zero edition of sodas. In the food, I tried to stop meat for two years and had good amount of vegetable, but unfortunately ended up with knee pain, which stop, stopped in a month post started to eat, eat red meat. Is that any specific deficiency I developed here after stopping eating meat? Is there any recommendation for better diet for maintaining bone joint strength? Uh, first of all, you need to check with the doctor when you completely. So I'm assuming that you only stopped red meat and not the white meat, which is chicken, fish and eggs. So I'm assuming, presuming that. Uh, if you're going to avoid red meat completely, yes, the few nutrients which red meat contains is iron. It contains vitamin B12, which sometimes tends to be deficient in specifically in people who are vegetarians. But avoiding red meat completely no, uh, and that led to uh, you know, causing joint pain. That's something which is not something which we see. So the first thing I would I would ask is, uh, when you were into vegetables, was your beans intake too high? And was there any history of uric acid? Did you do any test which you know uh, where they checked for your uric acid, which was causing joint, which might have caused joint pains for you? So because there are a lot of people who do not eat red meat at all. Red meat is not part of their uh, routine. So uh, but answering your last question in terms of red meat or protein, when we are talking about if you are a non-vegetarian, 
uh, always keep a balance because when you're talking about non-veg that is chicken fish it's not just vitamins and minerals it gives you the protein which is going to make sure another reason why so as i said assuming that you are eating white meat if you are not eating white meat either then i would say probably your muscle mass was getting weaker and that's the reason why you started having pain because as your muscle starts getting weaker it's causing fatigue but if you are having white meat then that would not be the case so balance between your protein which is going to maintain your lean muscle mass which helps with your stamina and metabolism and along with your vegetables and fruits so just refer to the the table that i showed the 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 picture that i showed you of the healthy plate if you see over there it's not just vegetables it's a combination of protein that's the white meat chicken or fish or something with the vegetables so can you uh, talk a little bit about the protein powder uh, which usually people take as part of their fitness program when they visit gyms etc what is it right to take protein powder if uh, if no what are those effects can you explain to us about it absolutely so there are two situations one is you are leading a sedentary lifestyle where you're just doing the regular workouts like running jogging and you know you are leading a normal desk job it's not moving around a lot and if you're able to manage your protein intake from the food which the protein sources are the beans the quinoa the non veg the dairy products and the nuts you technically do not need a protein supplement second situation is you are doing some more intensive workouts and you are a vegetarian or you don't eat that much of a portion of proteins in your diet then the normal whey protein supplements is absolutely fine to take that third situation is when you're doing extreme workouts like in gyms this is the time when if you're doing gym for fitness then using protein supplements which is like the isolates then it's fine we do not recommend the 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 isolate kind of protein powders if you're not doing workouts because the isolates are very thin filtered protein uh, molecules which means your kidneys have to filter it really well and that is possible when you're doing proper workouts because your metabolism is different when you have these kind of isolates uh, and with, without any extreme exercise it's an overload on your on your kidneys when you're going to go for those sensitive very strong protein supplements so having regular whey protein supplements is something which is advisable if you feel that your protein intake from the food is not whey protein just normal whey protein is what you can have uh, in general if you are not if you are doing regular normal workouts or if you are just sedentary lifestyle and your protein intake is not enough from the food uh there are a couple of questions on intermittent fasting i think we covered it already so anyone who missed that part you may want to click on the same link on the flyer and may want to listen to the recording is liposuction surgery for fat removal advisable for person age 45 plus i am not sure doctor if you would want to pick that question because that is not related to your yes. speciality yes. but i leave it to you it's if not, you want but to. just to give you a small information that is a very uh, incomplete information to tell whether the liposuction is good for a 45 age old person because when if any in your lifetime you've gone to a doctor you see that we take down all the history your physical your metabolic your clinical that is your blood test all these things and then we would say that okay is liposuction good for you or not good for you this is the usual practice that doctors would do of course lot of patients and doctors are that okay you want to do it and you go and do it but is it good or no is based on all your history or your medical history so yes uh, this is not something which i would i can answer about it with supplements is it okay to to take vitamin d or calcium for more than 3 months continuously calcium no we don't recommend to take uh, on a daily basis for more after 3 months also until unless your doctor says so 
Vitamin D, yes, you can take the basic dosage of 1000 units uh, because vitamin D is something which we see is a uh, majority of the population is deficient. So higher dosage only if you do the blood test to see how low your vitamin D is, then based on the doctor's decision, you can. So whether you want to take 50,000 units weekly or 60,000 units or just 10,000 units. But as a safeguard, yes, vitamin D of 1000 units is absolutely fine. This is something which almost everyone we do tell them to take. Is eating non veg diet daily, is it harmful? So probably, Doc, if you can explain what is a quant quantity of red meat or chicken, what is right uh, per day? What is the conception level? Okay. Right? So first of all, for that, we need to first understand how much should be your protein intake per day. So the the normal the regular guideline of protein intake says as long as you are within a normal weight uh, range one gram per kilogram body weight is what the protein intake should be so let's put it in numbers for example if you're 60 kgs and your requirement of protein should be 60 grams per day to just the maintenance then 60 grams of protein so for example if i'm putting it in vegetarian non-vegetarian i would say out of 100 percent you would have around 60 percent you can have it as non-veg that is the white meat in that five percent would be the red meat and rest 40 percent person can be the vegetarian protein that is your beans your dairy and your nuts the reason why this bifurcation is basically because of the biological value biological value means the absorptive capability of proteins when you're having proteins protein after absorption there is a lot of waste products that are produced like the creatinine urea uric acid and all those things which is filtered by the kidneys high biological value protein means the waste products that are produced are lesser and those are majorly the chicken the fish the egg bites that is a white meat and that's the reason why when you're talking about total protein the majority ratio is of the white meat and then the rest is your vegetarian meat in that around 5% is what we say red meat. So if again, if you put in numbers, you would say four times in a week you can have your chicken or fish. So again, 60 grams of protein, how much is it in form of chicken or fish? So when you're taking the weight, 100 grams of chicken, it approximately contains 30 grams protein, right? So if you're going to have 60 grams in a day, when you have 200 grams of chicken, you're getting the 60 grams of protein, provided the absorption is better, the absorption is good. So in that, let's say once or twice in a week, a red meat, lean cut, fresh meat, not the processed ones, not the with not with the fat uh, uh, content. So that's something which you can include to ensure that you're not consuming too much of red meat, which can affect the uric acid, uh, which is the unhealthy fat that is saturated fat, which can affect your visceral fat. There's a fat that surrounds your organs in your stomach, neither affecting your cholesterol levels and any of these things. So this is the average that you would say, but again repeating these measurements are always individualistic it's not the same for two people so it all depends on your history your height your weight your fat mass percentage based on this is what we calculate and we customize how much protein a person needs out of that how much white meat should be there red meat should be there and the vegetarian protein should be there Look how to maintain a healthy BMR. Healthy BMR is with a combination of uh, your food and exercise. The much better exercise you include, specifically the cardio exercises, the much better it helps you to raise your BMR. Uh, so basal metabolic rate is dependent on your energy balance that we had explained in the slide. Your input and your output when it comes at balance, it helps to keep your BMR at the higher level to ensure that you're not putting on weight. How to measure calorie intake and calorie outward from daily food habits? OK, again, this is from individualistic, so I'm just going to give you the general guidelines, the base from which we start. So uh, first of all, it's the classification when you are in the normal weight based on the normal ideal weight that you have how much calories per kilogram that we give so that's between the range of 25 to 30 calories or is what we say for an ideal uh, weight 
it can go lower when it is overweight like between 20 to 25 calories and it can go even lower if you're already in the obesity category that can go from 10 to 15 calories so let's say if it's a 60 kg uh, person uh, who who's ideal who's normal weight range and needs around 25 calories per kilogram body weight which almost approximately might come to 1200 to 1500 calories so out of that 1500 calories around 50 to 60 percent we say is carbohydrate this is the normal regular plate that i'm talking about 50 to 60 percent uh, 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 comes from the calories rest comes from the protein and rest comes from the fat this changes when the situation goes into a overweight category or obesity category where the same plate which I showed you, it, the carbohydrate comes down to directly 20 to 25 percent and the protein goes higher to around 40 to 50 percent. So this is how the calorie division is in terms of calories, protein and fat. Output is based on. So ideally what we say is whatever your calorie intake is minus 500 is what your calorie output should be in regular uh, aspects where it's a sedentary lifestyle. Your weight is ideal. Your food intake is balanced. So minus 500 is what we would say that your output should be when you're doing exercise. This starts increasing if your calorie intake is higher and your exercise intake was lower and you've reached a stage where it is overweight or obesity. Does apple cider vinegar help to reduce weight? Is it recommended to take every day? I don't recommend that because there's no science behind that yet. A lot of articles might say, but when you're talking about scientific guidelines where apple cider vinegar helps with weight loss, there is no proper science behind that. So that's something which I don't recommend. A lot of, lot of people do that because I have professionally or personally not seen a benefit of having apple cider vinegar on weight loss apart from just having acidity. So it's just a trend. It's just a trend. The green juices, apple cider vinegar, lemon and honey water. These are just the trends that have come up that you know when I have this. Yes, uh, and I'm not talking about apple cider vinegar, but there are certain concoctions which might help in detoxifying, like you have your ginger shots and all those things. It might help with detoxifying or cleansing your stomach, but with direct impact on the weight loss, no. It is, is it advisable to take weight loss protein shakes? Weight loss protein shakes we only advise when your body mass index that is a BMI is very high and we really need to make sure that your food intake, your calorie intake is very less, but it is not affecting your protein intake. So that's the only situation where we advise uh, weight loss supplements. Supplements, uh, what I'm talking supplements is the nutrition supplements, not medications. You have these certain herbs and pills that you get. No, I'm not talking about that. That's not my expertise, to be honest, and I don't recommend it until unless I have science behind that. But when you talk about weight loss, nutrition supplements, which you do have in market, which we do give to patients, but that's in situations where the intake has to be strictly restricted in terms of calories and fat, but the protein should not get compromised. And for a short period of time. Doc, does intermittent fasting affect female hormones and menstrual cycle? Not that I have read that uh, it affects, but as long again, as I said, the guideline says up to six to eight weeks. This is the reason why so that it doesn't affect your metabolism. Now, uh, the studies have still not uh, spoken much about uh, female hormones and uh, menstrual cycle. So six to eight weeks. Yes, it would not have an impact. After that, the studies have still not come up. How to avoid eating anything sweet after meal? So I think you answered that question, Doc. Probably uh, looking for any diary or fruits uh, products, which is without sugar. And few things is this is more of a behavioral as well. You know, as I said, it's an acquired habit. So uh, first of all, don't stock your fridge with any of this unhealthy sweet items. 
uh, physically move yourself away from the place where you're sitting and you're starting to crave your uh, crave for any sweet. So these are the few practices which over a period of time actually helps you to curb your cravings. When we stop certain food, it affects metabolic rate. How to keep normal good metabolic rate with keeping healthy diet? I don't understand the question. So, Doc, uh, the question is that while we stop certain food, uh, it affects the metabolic rate. Probably it uh, reduces. And what is the right way to keep up the metabolic rate? Keep the body burning on constantly in, in a normal manner. So the main so, thing is that's the reason why all these diets like intermittent fasting and keto is all known as fat diets because the main concept over it is don't remove a group completely, the food groups that you have, because once you remove it, yes, as you said, it might cause any metabolic changes and then starting that again, it's 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 an on and off graph. So to prevent that and to keep your BMR in the running rate, always have balanced food groups with your exercise to ensure that your metabolic rate is in a stable graph and it's not going up and down. It might sound very simple. Oh, this is something which I know, but it actually makes a very safe difference in maintaining your metabolic rate or in fact even increasing your metabolic rate. The only change with your food groups and your exercise is based on your weight how much you need to increase or how much you need to decrease. But including all the food groups ensures that there is no vitamin mineral deficiencies, which helps with your metabolism and further promote you to control your high calorie products. Next question is related to fitness. What is the right time or ideal time to walk? What is the time minimum to keep ourselves active? So we say ideally 150 minutes in a week is the basic uh, ideal uh, amount of time that you can uh, involve yourself with exercise. It can start off if you're not used to exercise, it can start off with normal walking and then as your stamina gets built up, then you can start off with, you know, um, uh, uh, brisk walking or jogging or cycling or running. Timing uh, it so definitely not after dinner as a, as a, as a so normal leisure walking after dinner as, as part of a bowel movement that's fine but as a part of exercise we do not recommend so not to do exercise when you are completely empty stomach that is the first thing in the morning without eating or drinking anything and not to do exercise in a very full stomach so ideal time i usually suggest is morning you have before your breakfast but have a small snack and then you have that or it can be some around evening time between four to seven so uh, these are in between your breakfast and lunch, depending on your working, your work timings. So these can be the timings when you're not completely empty, because when you're completely empty stomach, when you're doing exercise, you tend to produce more lactic acid. And when you're very full stomach, it's going to affect your digestion. And that's that's going to affect your further metabolism because you, after exercise is the time when majority of the fat is burnt. So during that time, if you're going to have indigestion, that's going to affect your exercise regime and also your absorption situation. Does uh, increased intake of citrus fruits have its effect on bone health? Sorry, again. Does increased intake of citrus fruits, mm -hmm. oranges, mm -hmm. lemons, uh, does it have any effect on bone health? Not directly. Oh. Not directly. Uh, is acidity related to stress? Yes, absolutely. Definitely. If you remember my, my, when we were talking about stress, the side effects I said, stubborn weight, weight gain, digestive issues. So acidity is definitely part of that. How weight gain is related to sleep apnea? Can it be cured? So the more you are uh, the weight is increasing it has a pressure on your lungs which can 
uh, stop your breathing in between or it can lead to gasping. So these are the symptoms which we say of sleep apnea. So definitely when your weight is increasing. So if you're already having the situation of snoring, uh, it's not just the septum that is affecting, but your lungs itself is pressured when your weight is going higher and that in fact then starts affecting your breathing. The general breathing you start breathing with your mouth and because of the pressure it can lead to gasping. So weight gain definitely has an impact on sleep, sleep apnea. So it's different types you can have because of weight gain. It can lead to obstructive sleep apnea where you're gasping. You literally stop breathing for a few seconds in between because of the uh, weight and then you start breathing again or you're breathing very loudly. These are the side of these are the effects where, which you see when your weight is on the higher side. What is the minimum or maximum hours to sleep per day? Four to six minimum up to eight maximum. But it's the quality of sleep, which means what time you're sleeping. So scientifically past midnight, the more late you're going to sleep, the more stress hormone is released, the more it's affecting the quality of your sleep. So ideal time that we, I usually say is by 11, 11, 50, 11, just go to bed so that if you're a fast sleeper, if you take time to sleep, at least go to bed by 10, 10, 30. So they are sleeping on time so that you go through the regular phases of sleep where it's initiation of phase, a, a initiation phase of sleep, your deep sleep, and then the waking up phase. To go smoothly through these phases, you need to have not just the quantity, but the quality. So two to four is the usual time that say where your, your brain, your mind is in deep sleep. So the more late you're going to go to sleep, the more it's affecting the phases of your sleep and the more quality wise your sleep is affected and the more it's increasing your stress. Why is that such a high proportion of people who lose weight put it back again? And what advice do you have to keep the weight off for good? OK, so it's more something called as a plateau period as well. Once you start doing these changes, it's it, it's like a panic mode for the body and your body is gradually reducing your weight. So one of the factors that we say of putting on weight again is, is genetic factor. If in general uh, there is a family history of obesity in family, then chances of gaining that weight again, because after one point your metabolism again starts going back to the norm because of the genetic predisposition. So because of that, there is always a tendency for you to put on weight. However, how to control that is always based. That's the reason why I said life. It's a lifestyle. It is not a duty that OK, you did it. You lost weight and that's it. Then you have lost it and then you're not going to put on. So you can start doing the what regular you used to do. When you create a habit as a lifestyle where you have a systemized protocol for your eating habits, for your exercise and your personal time, you will see that you're able to maintain your metabolism and that further helps you to control your weight on a longer run. But yes, chances of you to put on weight is always there if there is a family history. But how soon you can you re-put that weight or how much you delay it is based on the lifestyle factors that you are following. It's related. Next question is related to the uh, food items. Rice and potatoes are more problematic for a diet than the fat you eat. Uh, what is your uh, comment on that is there specific foods like white rice white bread white pasta sugar so is there any food you think should be avoided on a regular basis so when you talk about white or the white concept of food it's not from the calorie consumption that we're talking about the concept of brown bread is better than white bread or brown rice is better than white rice is more from the absorption levels. So this is something which we term always as glycemic index. So when you're talking about white calories, so let's say put it in numbers, a white bread has 100 calories and a brown bread also approximately has 100 calories. But the difference is white bread, which is without the fiber. So this white bread is completely digested faster and the calories are absorbed faster. Whereas when you're talking about the whole grain versions of the brown bread, to put it a simple way, if it contains 100 calories because of the fiber content, which prevents the conversion into the simple nutrients, maximum hardly, let's say 50 to 60 calories might be absorbed. And that is the reason why when you're talking about white rice or white uh, bread or all these things, this is the reason why we say it's unhealthy and it's better to go for a whole grain version. 
With potatoes, it's again the glycemic index. If you're going to have the potatoes with the fiber, because fiber is the main role. If you see a lot of everyone say, oh, eat a lot of salads, you know, you just the main reason is fiber fills you up. It fills you up for a longer time, so your food intake in general goes down. And because it's in a whole grain version, you're making sure that are, your overeating is not happening of the whole grains. And along with that, clinically, the fiber is ensuring that all these formation of the nutrients or the calories is not happening. And if formation doesn't happen, absorption doesn't happen. And absor after absorption, if excise is not there, it is deposited into the body. And deposition happens in the form of fat. So it's not that... Uh, carb, rice or potato is bad then uh, fat. It's about how you consume it, whether it's a refined or whether it's a whole grain, and then how much is the utilization in terms of physical activity. So there's no harm in having potatoes or sweet potatoes or this, but a whole grain version or a fiber rich version, which means with the skin. And of course, portion control. Which fruits are considered heavy fructose or uh, glucose fruits? OK, so. All the fruits contain glucose and fructose, so the glucose content is more in fruits like the berries, cherries, uh, oranges, avocados. The fructose rich uh, fruits would be your apple, mangoes, nectarines, plum, peaches, pears. A custard apple, these would be the more fructose rich uh, foods. So, Doc, which is better, fructose or glucose rich? Um, so that that again depends on the clinical condition. So for people who are having digestive issues, who are they are not uh, able to digest the sugars, for them fructose will not be good. Calorie wise, both will be the same as long as you're having it with the fiber. Then the difference is for certain in fructose also there are certain fruits like fruits like bananas, uh, mangoes, which has again the term that I was telling high glycemic index, which means the absorption of the calories are much faster than fruits like berries, cherries and all those things. So I would advise having fruits like the berries, cherries, orange family, you know, these uh, apple and all those things as long as there is no allergies or digestive issues which is causing trouble to digest the fructose sugar. Is there a substitute for sugar especially having tea with milk for example jack tea or brown sugar what do you recommend? Calorie wise uh, it's the same the only difference is uh, one spoon of jaggery or one spoon of dates or one spoon of honey is equal to almost two to two and a half spoons of normal white sugar. Uh, brown sugar, white sugar is exactly the same. Do not be deceived that you know brown sugar is better than white sugar. Calorie wise, absorption wise, it's exactly the same. Even if you read the again nutrition label, if you actually read the nutrition label, you see it's exactly the same. But when you're talking about substitutes like dates, honey, jaggery, because the quantity needed is much lesser than uh, the, so automatically the calorie intake gets much lesser because you're going to use small portions. What should be the minimal time gap between dinner and sleeping in kids? What's the side effect if the gap is not enough? At least two hours for kids, at least up to three hours. Uh, it's simple. It affects your digestion and causes causes malabsorption. That's that's the that's how it starts. Is a low fat in milk healthier option than full fat? Are these healthy fats? So it's good for us. So the fat form of uh, in dairy products more of the unhealthier fats that is the saturated fats which has an impact on the LDL cholesterol which is one of the component of considered as bad cholesterol. Now when you're talking about full fat and low fat again it's from the calorie consumption also we do prefer low fat but not zero fat because when you're going for zero fat versions it also 
contains lot of starch and sugar because let's be realistic we are into commercial products commercial products they need to sell and if it's tasty then it sells so if fat is removed which technically gives taste to the food starch and sugar is another replacement that's added so but with low fat the, the addition is almost negligible because it still contains fat but the content of the fat is much lesser so there is no harm in having low fat however if you are into habit of having full fat one of the healthier ways that i usually suggest is once you boil your milk the fat that is formed on the top just remove that and and then you can use that milk so it's naturally becoming low fat but for kids we do not recommend low fat unless it the the clinical condition requires that for them full fat is absolutely fine can you uh, explain a little bit if sparkling water can be used instead of sodas yes instead of sodas the plain sparkling water so again you have to read the nutrition label because there are a lot of sparkling waters which has preservatives extra preservatives added to that the ones which is just made into sparkling water with just carbon dioxide that's something which you can have uh, and you can just flavor it up with your fruits but it should not be a replacement for water like lot of people have a habit of having sodas with their meals as a replacement of water no this is not a replacement of water this is just for a change that once in a while you want to have something different apart from water as a as a drink yes this is something which you can use so can you recommend a diet or any specific food or any uh, drink which can be used for fatty liver there's no specific food but uh, all these juices the vegetable juices and vegetable fruits or fruits as it is is absolutely beneficial when you are talking about fatty liver because the vitamins and minerals helps to uh, how to put it uh, uh it's it's like an ointment to the liver to make sure that it is not getting inflamed with uh, and vitamins and minerals help to make sure that the inflammation is going down the main thing with fatty liver we tell to avoid is too much of spicy foods and very high fatty foods and that can even sometimes be the healthy fats because liver is the organ which processes all the fats and when you have fatty liver even including high portion of healthy fats it's it's the fat processing that's causing in this inflammation so spicy and oily and fatty foods is what we tell to uh, remove there is nothing specific food uh, which directly helps with fatty liver but as i said combination of vegetables and fruits is something which we tell to have as much as you can along with lots of water which helps to make sure that the inflammation is going down slowly but you have these green juices and all they absolutely safe and good to have because of again same concept is the same the form of consumption can be different so how should you consider ghg slash co2 footprint in your diet or food choices i don't understand that question. so i'm not sure if it is related to diet uh, probably it is related to esg can i ask uh, whoever has mentioned this question to write to me directly if it is a carbon dioxide footprint uh, it might be related to esg uh, doc can you explain if it is good to skip any of lunch or dinner intermittently and just staying hydrated i think that is similar yes. to what you said yeah, that's maybe. fine it's same similar to intermittent fasting but you're not just fasting fasting for hours you skip your meals you just have some soup or just water that's fine that's okay as long as you make sure that you have maintained your vitamins and protein intake throughout the day it should not be that you're replacing your calories but you also end up replacing your protein and your vitamins and minerals next question doc is there are quite good number of questions for so certain questions i have to skip when it's repeated uh on i take celery juice with lime every day first thing in the morning is it harmful when i do it on a long run no as long as you are comfortable with that it's an antioxidant it's vitamin c if you're comfortable you don't have any acidity it's not affecting your digestion that's fine certain concoctions or certain foods the concept is even if it doesn't help you as long as it's not harming you 
we can always have that because again these are foods it's not something chemical that you're taking so it's just natural foods if you're comfortable doing that and you feel good about it just go ahead with that doc one of the audience want to see the healthy plate on the presentation once again sure okay. The presentation has gone. This one? It's gone? Yeah. One second. Let me just. Can you see it now? Can you see my plate, the, the slide? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if anyone want to take a picture of this. Going ahead with the question, uh, Doc. Uh, is it harmful to take chicken every single day? Uh, the audience, he takes grilled chicken in lunch every single day with salad, but is it harmful? It's not as long as the brands that you buy where the lot of brands which has um, chicken is something which has antibiotics and hormones uh, added in certain brands. Uh, so as long as you're buying buying the brand where it is labeled no antibiotics, no hormones, there is no harm. The only one uh, disadvantage of having chicken because it produces a lot of heat in the body. So sometimes it can uh, affect your bowel movements in terms of causing a lot of heat and constipation. So it's it's your uh, body's bowel movements that needs to say. But otherwise, it, as long as the brands that you buy is like no added antibiotics and no hormones, you can have that every day. That's fine. What is your thought about no carb diet? Absolute no. Do not go on a no carbohydrate diet because your brain needs energy. Brain does not take energy from protein and fat. It needs sugar. So the first thing in the morning, the reason why we say have a healthy breakfast is because your body, your brain needs. Brain is the one which needs the majority amount of nutrition to control your body. So it's no carbohydrate diet is the only only in the situation where a person is having epilepsy or seizures where they have to go on a ketogenic diet because it interferes with their seizure episodes. That's the only situation where we say no carbohydrate. Next question is, is there any uh, food which can be included in the diet for hair, good hair growth and uh, nails? So you have vitamin E rich. It can be your nuts, your seeds, which is rich in vitamin E, which is good for your hair, uh, biotin and zinc, which you'll find in whole grains and leafy vegetables. Like spinach, molokia, these kind of leaves. My uric acid is not getting under control in spite of regular medicines. Please suggest some solution. So is there any solution from a nutrition perspective? For uric acid, we definitely put the person on a low protein diet because as I said, protein is broken down into waste products after the processing and uric acid is one of the component. So we put them on a low uric acid diet. How much is the how low the protein is based is based on the person's weight. If you are saying uh, we usually say around 0.8 to uh, 0.9 grams per kilogram of the body weight is what we say as a protein. And in this also the high biological value protein that I suggest it, but not on a delay. So let's say vegetarian protein like the beans and the lentils and the dairy products, you would say or nuts, we would say just once in a or twice in a week and three days or four days you can have the high biological value protein in small portions like a portion, small portion of chicken or just egg white and one or two days to be completely vegetarian without any protein. So this is how and drink lots and lots of water. And of course, avoid caffeine, avoid alcohol, alcohol, avoid processed foods and avoid sugars. This doesn't directly raise your uric acid, but it doesn't help you to reduce your uric acid. That smoothie with a lot of fruit substitute uh, our breakfast intake. Not a lot of fruits, but yes, smoothie with combination of fruits and even some nuts can be a replacement for your breakfast. Because again, as I said, when you're talking about 
smoothies with fruits nuts and dairy so it has carbohydrate from the fruits it has fiber from the fruits it has fat from the nuts and it has the protein from your dairy and you are getting your combination over there it's much better than skipping your breakfast and then ending up eating something unhealthy taking lemon juice with warm water every day in the morning is it safe for the teeth enamel is it good for weight loss not good for weight loss because there is no science behind that it does not it's not proven that it helps with weight loss which i repeated last time but uh, with teeth enamel yes it can have an impact stevia organic sweetener can it be used to, uh, will it cause to release insulin question is actually it uh, if sugar that causes to release insulin even sweetener without calories can uh, also cause this so it's basically of insulin resistance does the stevia help in that stevia does not help in that but stevia doesn't harm in that stevia is just a psychological replacement for your sugar it's not going to impact your insulin resistance either in the positive way or in the negative way Next and question. stevia is something which we might say it's a bit safer because stevia is something which we even recommend to pregnant ladies which they can have in case if they want to have sugar instead of the normal sugar so it's a little safer but having an impact on insulin resistance neither yes not no with stevia next question doc is related to kids that uh, one of my kid is not willing to eat every time we have to uh, force every time to have food what do you suggest in this case that's I'm a lot sure you might be, uh, you might <laughs> that would take at least one hour stuff. because with kids it's more of the behavior than the than the healthy eating aspect it's about what you as family do what practices you have at home what you have been doing in terms of distraction feeding like watching tv and all uh, you know a lot of factors are there with kids so this is something which we'll have to sit face to face and talk about is mixed fruit juice bad because some fruits cannot be mixed with others so there are a lot of things with alternative medicine with jsc so what is your thought on that doc you're talking about the ready made ones or the fresh ones i i think the question it's not mentioned but i think it would be uh, related to the uh, the ones which we prepare at home that can be mixed fruit no, juices there is, there is no specific contraindication that we see like food and food interaction yes if you are going to use uh, calcium uh, or like dairy with vitamin c rich fruits then yes so sometimes if you, vitamin c is not something which you are going to get or iron is not something which you are going to get but just mixing fruits uh, as long as again if you don't have any allergies uh, like you know uh, uh, you have ulcerative colitis or if you have ibs that is irritable bowel syndrome then mixing of the fruits it's individual if you don't have trouble just go ahead it is no specific contraindication what is the protein options for veg vegetarian diet quinoa is a good option beans are a good option dairy nuts even spinach has some amount of protein so that's also a good option soya yes that's your choice if you like soya soya is a good option uh, does drinking hot water or warm water has any help in reducing weight not for weight but definitely for acidity it does have an impact it's technically so when you're talking about cold water even with fat and all when you're having cold water it technically it's same the concept where you have a uh, hot oil and then you keep it in the fridge it gets hardened same is with the concept when you're having cold water it's kind of not washing off the food pipe but warm water not hot water but warm water lukewarm water definitely helps with that so it's basically like it helps you with the cleansing of your food pipe and digestive system not with weight what could be the options for body detox what should be the frequency of doing the detox so the the most basic i tell some of our patients is monthly twice you can do a detox diet that can start off with an up to 7 days is what the maximum is but if you're doing the 7 day detox once in 6 months is more than enough and that can be the first two days you just rely on vegetables and fruits lots of soups fresh juices fresh salads fresh fruits by the third day you can start adding protein 
and third and fourth day you can start adding protein with your vegetables and fruits and then you can by fifth sixth day you can start adding one source of carbohydrate and then by seventh to seventh day you can start up with your health. the main detox days is the first two three days where you drink lots of water and lots of fiber with vegetables and fruits that's that's good enough and detox is something which is again not a very mandate thing because water originally and your liver these are the two natural reasons to detox your body on a regular basis on a daily basis when you drink lots of water and liver helps you to detox your body but this is something which also you can do based on the number of days that you're going to do so twice in a month you can definitely do it you know so specifically for females a lot of females complain of being bloated and all pre periods post periods so that's one way you know you can just relax your digestive system or when 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 you're very stressed out you know that's another uh, time to just detox yourself uh, if you have a lot of digestive issues for one or two days you can detox yourself so this is the reasons where you can try detoxing yourself if it's for 7 days then once in 6 months is more than enough bodybuilders are eating right before going to sleep to gain muscle however fat burning occurs during our sleep while body rest how is that possible to turn the body to burn fat build muscles at the same time while we are at rest can you repeat the question so doc it is basically bodybuilders they mm-hmm. when they because they work out the uh, there is uh, the science behind it is that they're resting uh, metabolism there is something yes. resting metabolism which happens for them so how is that what should we do to increase our resting metabolism is there a diet related to it now so it's more of the lifestyle behavior related if you see the bodybuilders they are very disciplined when do they sleep how many hours they sleep even after doing exercise they make sure with the exercise they make sure that their muscles are strong enough from the diet itself they do have their recovery protein intake after the exercise so this discipline is what helps them with their resting energy expenditure which does not happen to be honest in our regular lifestyle we don't have a discipline neither for eating habits neither for our lifestyle in terms of exercise neither for our sleep once you start doing this you will see your resting en- energy expenditure actually gets much higher is there any special diet or routine for pcod uh, it's a low sugar diet very low sugar diet uh is it is which diet is good for alzheimer patients is there a specific alzheimer's. diet of, yeah alzheimer's uh there's nothing specific specific because uh, studies have are still going on but uh, being on a high protein diet because protein the amino acids or an amino acid helps with the nervous system metabolism and that helps with uh, uh, alzheimer's but it's still it's not effective it's it's not effective the uh, studies also have said that diet does not play a major role in either delaying alzheimers of course healthy eating will make sure that uh, you are delaying any health issues to your body but with specifically with alzheimers diet does not play a very major role in that look is there any specific diet which you would recommend for females uh, after their menopause uh low sugar definitely but uh, what we tell them to be on is because after menopause you know a lot of these side effects or symptoms like hot flashes and all these things are there so for them we usually recommend to be on a good antioxidant uh, diet from antioxidants which is from the berries cherries the leaf vegetables which also gives you also zinc and uh, magnesium because these are the deficiencies that we see usually after menopause so including your uh, leaf vegetables your nuts your uh, seeds this is something which we tell to include healthy fats because it works like an anti inflammatory as i said and that also helps uh, with the hot flashes and all after menopause so that's something which you can you can have and what is a uh, vegetarian options that you suggest after the age of uh, 40 vegetarian options for what for after 40 after 40 years after 40 is vegetarian options yes 
Mm, I didn't understand that question because so doc uh, because the uh, after 40 years normally you know there are certain conditions like joints go on toss there is a weak joint the bone health goes down mm -hmm. so is there a specific vegetarian option which you would suggest to improve those conditions so that it doesn't so work concepts it? like osteoarthritis or arthritis or you know osteoporosis is something we usually say to have a good calcium again the high bio bioavailability calcium so that will be spinach that will be uh, your uh, orange fat family, your berries, cherries, uh, it would be your iron again, which would be your dates, your seeds. Uh, these are the things which we tell, but this is just an addition. You will always have to have a balanced diet. This is what prevents these kind of conditions. What we are talking about or the questions are about if this happens, what am I supposed to do? And the main concept of discussion over here is to prevent that situation to happen as maximum as we can. But it's not about after age 40 vegetarian options, vegetarian options and you, know, you have your vegetables, you have your fruits, you have your beans, so it's not specific to age. So there are quite a lot of questions. I don't think we can finish it in another 30 minutes. Also, there are a few questions which is like, can I have a packet of chips one day? Can I have a, a packet of chocolate? I'm sorry, doctor has already mentioned that these are we need to go on a healthy lifestyle. That was the intention behind uh, these sessions. So doc, we will quickly pick up another most uh, important questions, five questions, and we will wind up the session. So doc, is there any diet or food which you would suggest to improve bloating? Rather than improving bloating, we would suggest what you need to avoid, try avoiding the universal gas forming foods like the milk, the beans, not the lentils, the beans, gas forming vegetables like the cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus. These are usually uh, you know, sulfur containing gas forming uh, products. So uh, these are the things which in general cause bloating in the general population. So eliminating this is one step. Second is avoid spicy foods strictly during when you're having bloating because that will just aggravate your bloating. Third thing is you have to first also understand uh, was there any food which technically led to this bloating because even not getting good sleep uh, or not eating on time can also cause bloating. Having long gap between your meals also causes bloating or distension. So first you have to find is there any behavioral factors which is causing this bloating? If no, then food. These are the general foods, spicy foods, processed foods, any packet foods during that time is complete no no because that's going to be heavy to di digest. What what are your thoughts about the packaged soups which we get as a non? Sorry, coming back. Sorry, sorry. Coming back to the previous question itself. So this is kind of home remedies, but now it does have a scientific reasons. So you know, uh, some. Uh, I'm I'm just talking from my aspect as well. You have these anti-flatulent uh, products like you have your fennel seeds, you have your carom seeds. These are scientifically proven to be anti-flatulent. So, you know, having that as part of your meal, either you boil it the water and have that water, or you just consume it directly. That to a certain extent can help with bloating, like reduce the bloating. So that's something which you can try if you have this frequent episodes of bloating. Now let's go to the next question. Doc, what is uh, your thought about the packaged soups which we get? Can it be considered as an alternate? Uh, no, not a regular alternate. It can be like an emergency alternate where you like once in two weeks, once in a week where you were really busy and you rather than going empty stomach, if this is what you're going to have, then that's fine. But it's not a regular replacement that daily you just have a packet soup and then you, you're fine with that because all these packet products will have a lot of preservatives, which affects, I'm not talking from the weight perspective, but it affects the digestion after one point. Look, I, there is one question. What is the relationship between fatty liver and obesity? I think part of it, you already explained that even the healthy food, uh, healthy fat 
fats uh, fats which we take it is actually metabolized and stored in uh, liver so that might be the reason of uh, obesity the relation between the weight and fatty liver is when as i said as your weight is going higher your fat deposition is going higher right and this fat deposition need not always be just near the hips and the belly and all those things it also starts depositing around the organs of your stomach which includes your liver your kidneys and all and as so this is known as a visceral fat so your uh, your organs in general have a thin layer of fat visceral fat which helps like a protective cushion for these organs but as your weight increases which means your fat deposition of fat accumulation is increasing and all this accumulation is around these organs specifically with liver as well so as the accumulation increases the fat deposition in liver also increases to such an extent that the liver is not able to process it and eliminate it and that is one of the reason why it leads to fatty liver is there uh, uh, is there any food which you think can improve the fatty liver i think you answered this yes, question answered. yes doc uh, had you any patients for fibroids did you in uh, any time prepare any uh, specific diet for fibroids yes uh, we did but that was more based on their history because during fibroids we usually we usually follow uh, a low sugar diet but that is more customized based on the patient's body composition analysis and uh, we also make sure that any and any inflammatory or any inflammation producing uh, foods again the sulfur containing foods the beans and all we reduce it because all these uh inflammatory causing or inflammation causing foods tends to affect the side effects of fibroid or aggravate the side effects of fibroids yeah i think we can wind up uh the session there are few comments saying that you know there is an audience a member who continues to have bloating even after taking vegetables or cabbage i i think the right thing to do is to consult your doctor uh, have your basic investigations done probably it could be food allergy or then the doctor can refer you for a clinical uh, dietitian and accordingly you can take it further thank you so much doc it was very informative we had more than 90 questions we had actually i had to screen through the questions and read out for you thank you so much for your time thanks everyone for joining the session thank you so much